Welcome back to Season 2 of 12 Days in March. In this video, we will cover the cystic renal diseases for USMLE Step 1. The questions on this topic are narrow in scope, and with the slightest effort, you should be able to ace your way through this section. The major players to be familiar with are medullary sponge kidney and polycystic kidney disease. PKD comes in two forms, autosomal recessive, which is the childhood form of the disease, or autosomal dominant, which is seen later in life. The differences between the two become a major area of test inquiry. In this slide, you will see the key players listed across the top. Before we are done with this topic, you will be familiar with the key genetic and pathologic descriptions, as well as the clinical presentation and key associations for the USMLE. You'll note the pathogenesis is included for purposes of promoting your understanding of these disorders, but truth told, the disease mechanisms are only loosely worked out and aren't the major focus of test inquiry. Again, the information on pathogenesis is included to promote a conceptual understanding of these disorders. Let's knock off medullary sponge kidney straight away as there really are only two key pieces of information to be familiar with. Taking it from the top, there are no important genetic associations to memorize and the pathogenesis is unknown other than to mention it is a congenital developmental abnormality. That's easy enough. As such, you will only need to be familiar with the pathologic description and the complications. So when you see the phrase cystic dilation of the medullary collecting ducts, they are describing medullary sponge kidney. I've emphasized these components in the box, dilated collecting ducts and medullary portion, which should be easy to remember as this is called medullary sponge kidney. This is the language of MSK. On the USMLE, this description is most often seen as a distractor with one notable exception that we'll cover in a moment. As for presentation, it is most often discovered incidentally when imaging is pursued for other indications. To be clear, clinicians don't look at a patient and say, hey, maybe they have MSK, let's order imaging. Rather, the majority of these patients are asymptomatic. Of course, that doesn't make for great test fodder. So other than a distractor in renal cystic questions, how else might it be presented? And the answer is stones. Pictured here is an image demonstrating calcific deposits in the renal medulla, termed medullary nephrocalcinosis. This is an extreme form of renal calcification that they can certainly question you about. However, for our purposes, I would keep life simple and be aware of the association between MSK and nephrolithiasis. Since the stones complicate a developmental abnormality, they are generally seen in younger patients. And again, to clarify, they aren't going to say what is the most common complication of MSK. They will describe a radiograph with cystic dilation of the collecting duct and normal renal function and no known metabolic abnormalities, such as hyperparathyroidism or hyperuricemia. They'll expect you to know this is medullary sponge kidney, and then they'll ask the derivative questions such as, which of the following is the most likely complication in this patient with cystic dilation seen on imaging? Answer, stone. And that really is the full Monty on MSK, so let's move this along. To the two other disorders, autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant, PKD. I will present information in this chart for comparative purposes. The USMLE is fond of comparing and contrasting these two disorders. After completing this chart, we'll review a couple of summary slides on each of the conditions, which will hopefully bring this topic all together for you. Now, as you can see, we have a big old star highlighting the importance of genetics. In fact, if a disease is named autosomal recessive or autosomal dominant, one would conclude the importance of that genetic association. I am sure most students simply remember the adult form is autosomal dominant with the AD in adult serving as a reminder. If autosomal dominant is the adult form, then common sense tells us the autosomal recessive is associated with the childhood form. The genetic mutation in both forms affect the PKD gene, except the childhood form has an H tossed in reflecting the hepatic involvement as we will cover. So you can see in this table that autosomal recessive PKD is associated with PKHD mutation and autosomal dominant is associated with PKD1 or 2 mutation. I do list the chromosomes for completeness, but they don't specifically ask. In fact, the PKD2 mutation in the adult form is located on chromosome 4, not 16. 
I wouldn't stress over chromosomal numbers. So now you have the genetic mutation, but what are the aberrant proteins that derive from those mutations? In autosomal recessive, fibrocystin is defective, whereas in autosomal dominant, polycystin is the defective protein. Generically speaking, both mutations affect proteins that are involved in cell adhesion, proliferation, and cell-to-cell -cell communication. Regarding the proteins themselves, there are three noteworthy points. First, the disease mechanisms are loosely defined, so you are unlikely to see test questions about these proteins per se. That's probably the most important point. Secondly, there is not one mutation that leads to defective protein production. In fact, there are hundreds which account for the varying phenotypic presentations, and this is particularly relevant in the childhood form, as we'll discuss shortly. And thirdly, it is conceptually important to realize these proteins are found in other tissues beside the kidney. Having this awareness will permit you to consider disease manifestations beyond the kidney. Specifically, in autosomal recessive disease, abnormalities of fibrocystin give rise to biliary dysgenesis, which may manifest as congenital hepatic fibrosis. In the autosomal dominant form, abnormalities of the polycystin protein impact vascular smooth muscle manifest by cerebral aneurysms. We'll circle back to this information, but keep in mind the manifestations aren't random disconnected events. They share the same pathophysiologic derangement as seen in the kidney. Moving along to the pathologic description, this is most apt to be useful in the description of childhood PKD. This disorder is characterized by small cysts with elongated channels of the distal nephron. The channels might be described as running at right angles to the cortical surface as depicted in this image. In contrast to medullary sponge kidney, these cysts replace both the medulla and cortex, generating a characteristic sonographic appearance on prenatal screening. Compare and contrast that with a pathologic description of large cysts that eventually replace renal parenchyma in the autosomal dominant form. Nothing too exciting here. Cysts are present, but we already knew that. If I'm going to test you on disease pathology, autosomal recessive would be my target. And this is a good time to conceptualize what is going on between the two different entities. Here you can see the distal nephron affected by autosomal recessive disease compared to involvement of all nephron segments in autosomal dominant disease. Returning to our table, insofar as clinical presentation, the autosomal recessive form is dependent on the phenotypic expression of the specific mutation. This determines age of onset and severity. In majority, these patients will present with kidney enlargement and varying degrees of renal insufficiency. But here is a key distinguishing characteristic from the adult form. Patients with autosomal recessive disease always have some degree of biliary dysgenesis. In the most severe form, they will suffer from congenital hepatic fibrosis, presenting with typical signs of portal hypertension, including edema, ascites, and varices. Remember, the mutation PKHD with the H standing for hepatic involvement. In the autosomal dominant form, these patients present with progressive cystic destruction of the renal parenchyma, with cysts generally detected in the 20s, leading to progressive renal insufficiency that is noted in the fourth decade and beyond. And finally, here are the disease associations, which happen to also be a major focus of test inquiry. As we've already mentioned, autosomal recessive is characterized by hepatic fibrosis. This is one standout feature. The other is related to the renal insufficiency and the development of oligohydramnios. Remember, amnion consists mostly of fetal urine. If the fetus is not making urine, there is a decrease in amnion. Amnion, however, is necessary for normal lung development. So the prenatal form of autosomal recessive disease is associated with pulmonary hypoplasia, which is a secondary manifestation related to the renal insufficiency. In autosomal dominant disease, cysts may be seen in the liver, but the key association is with intracranial or berry aneurysms. And with that, we can now bring all this material home. So here is the summary material that we just presented. For reasons discussed, namely congenital hepatic fibrosis, I refer to autosomal recessive PKD as a renohepatic disorder. It is characterized by cystic dilations of the collecting ducts and biliary dysgenesis. The defective gene is PKHD that leads to a defective protein, fibrocystin, which is easiest to think about as a structural protein found both in the kidney and the biliary ducts.
the kidneys are enlarged and pathologically described as having small radiating cysts that lead to interstitial fibrosis. Here is another image of those elongated channels running at right angles to the cortical surface. Insofar as disease severity, this is dependent on the number of collecting ducts that are involved, and these vary phenotypically by the individual mutations. And speaking of phenotypic expression, here are the range of disease manifestations. In the severe forms, autosomal recessive may be detected on prenatal ultrasound, which reveals both an abnormal appearance to the kidney as well as oligohydramnios. If sufficiently severe, the neonate may manifest respiratory distress due to pulmonary hypoplasia. If less severe, the liver may be the presenting manifestation. It would be extremely unlikely for the USMLE to go after you with a question describing congenital hepatic fibrosis as the presenting manifestation of autosomal recessive PKD, but do be aware. And to summarize the autosomal dominant or adult form, nephromegaly is the first standout feature. You'll spend your entire clinical career examining the abdomen and palpating for nephromegaly or masses, but these are the kidneys you are most apt to encounter on clinical exam. The other presenting manifestations include hypertension, which makes sense due to progressive renal insufficiency. Flank pain occurs due to stretching of the capsule, but more commonly due to hemorrhage into the cysts, which may be manifest by hematuria. Other causes of flank pain include infection and stones. And unfortunately, the other manifestation is progressive renal failure. Do be aware that whereas congenital hepatic fibrosis is seen in autosomal recessive disease, hepatic cysts are seen in the autosomal dominant form, but are rarely of clinical consequence. This slide is included purely for conceptual purposes. It highlights my view of this disorder as an adhesion defect with abnormalities of cell-to-cell -cell and cell-to-matrix interactions. On the left, you can see the presence of a normal polycystin protein spanning two epithelial cells as well as connecting those cells to the underlying matrix. On the right, abnormalities are noted with loss of connectivity. How this actually translates into cyst development is unknown. Insofar as cerebral aneurysms, this really is the big ticket item. They like to describe a patient with manifestations of autosomal dominant disease and ask the derivative question about which comorbid condition exists or is likely to occur in the patient. As noted, whatever defect exists in the kidney accounting for development of those cysts is also present in the liver and presumably in the vascular smooth muscle. Informationally, the highest risk for aneurysm formation includes those with a family history of aneurysm and or poorly controlled hypertension. It is estimated that approximately 10% of patients with PKD develop aneurysms, and these account for approximately 5% of deaths in patients with PKD. Do note, there is no single gold standard established for screening these patients, but the take-home message is that serial assessment should be considered. That is, a one-time screen does not mean a patient with PKD will remain free of aneurysm formation. And here is a summary slide of what we've previously discussed. This is included just for your reference. We've covered the clinical presentation to include both the renal and extra-renal manifestations. Insofar as data, the diagnosis depends on the demonstration of multiple and or bilateral renal cysts, the number of which vary by age. If the diagnosis is uncertain, genetic testing can be pursued. And under special notes, I summarize what we've already mentioned about cerebral aneurysms. Do note, once the GFR begins to drop, the rate of progression is approximately 5 mLs per minute per year. And finally, ACE inhibitors do confer some clinical benefits in this patient population above and beyond blood pressure lowering alone. And finally, here is our comparative chart summarizing the key features that have been highlighted throughout this presentation. Be familiar with the language of each disorder and the key associations and complications. If you have any questions or concerns about any of the material presented, please contact me at 12days.com. Thank you.